Today we're going to be talking about early theories, uh, just some examples more of theories of matter and so on, as well as introduce some of the glassware that maybe you'll be familiar with or that you would be exposed to in a laboratory. So this first one's a cartoon and it's showing a, a, a Greek individual here and he's looking at a piece of pottery and he realizes it's composed of these four elements. 29% air, 15% water, 31% earth, and 25% fire. An early theory on matter was that everything was made of one of those four elements. They were the simplest things that they could come up with. And they even gave them symbols. So fire looks a little bit like a triangle. That's still a symbol that we use today in chemistry to indicate fire. Water looks a bit like, I suppose, waves of water. The earth looks like an arrow pointing down to the earth, and this looks like an arrow pointing up to the air. So th that was the four element theory. All right. Now perhaps you've heard of Plato. He was a philosopher, and he was an atomist, meaning that he believed in the existence of atoms, even though he could clearly not see individual atoms. He believed that that was the fundamental building block of all matter. And uh, there was actually a term for that, atomos, which means indivisible. And he thought all matter was composed of four elements. Earth, water, fire, air. Let's do that again. Earth, water, fire, air, and ether. Now I know that's five things, but they understood there are certain things that couldn't be explained. And so they came up with this other element called ether. Now you can see all matter fits together on this matter. Fire and water are sort of opposites. Air and earth are a little bit separate. So if you want to make a clay pot, you take a certain amount of earth, you add some water, and you mix it with the air and hit it with fire, and you will get pottery. And so that's how the four element theory worked. Now you could add other things such as fire and air would be hot, earth and water would be cold and so on. We can, we can remember we said models get more complicated as they go on. So do theories. Uh, this is just another graphic kind of showing how those four element theory now we believe in you know closer to a hundred plus elements on the periodic table. So again that theory has changed over time. Well I want to go through some early ideas of matter and again this is not testable by any means, but nevertheless, <coughs> excuse me, I want to go through these with you. Uh, this is the artist, the uh, Rodin, this is the thinker, if you are an art person. So here's a very early philosophy, an idea on matter. Now I don't know how to speak Greek or say names, but if you say it with some confidence, it sounds like you know what you're saying. So I'm going to say this guy's name is Anaxagoras. Alright, I'm sure I slaughtered his name, but I, he's not there to correct me. Now he was Greek and he was born about 2500 years ago and he his idea was that every substance had its own kind of seeds that clustered together to make substances kind of like atoms grouped together to make compounds and molecules and you and I. Now I like the simplicity of this because well I'm a gardener. A lot of seeds look very similar and then after you plant them one seed develops a tomato plant, another one makes a cucumber plant, another one makes an oak tree. And so seeds seem like the simplest building block. It's, it's not a bad idea. Then we have this person ten years later, uh, I'm going to say Empedocles, I don't really know how you say his name, suggested only four basic seeds, earth, air, fire, and water, and they combine to make everything else. And then along comes Democritus. Now Democritus, um, he, I guess he maybe stole other people's ideas a little bit, right? Now he was a brilliant philosopher himself. He came up with the, the concept of democracy, of you know how we rule uh, today, and he was born you know another 20 years later. So he's simply metaphorically standing on the shoulders of those that came before him, and he came up with a word. Adam. He called it atomos, and that meant indivisible, meaning you couldn't divide it any further. He believed this, uh, and that idea of atoms existed 
for, well, it would have been a long time, except there was another philosopher named Aristotle. And Aristotle did not agree with this idea of atoms. And because Aristotle was sort of like, uh, if, if, if I date myself, Michael Jordan in basketball in the 1980s, he was just so much better than everybody else. Well, Aristotle said atoms don't exist, and therefore that idea was lost for about 2,000 years. Right? That's how strong of an influence Aristotle had. And even though Aristotle didn't believe the theory, he tweaked it a little bit, and he's the one that added those qualities of like heat, cold, dryness, and so on. All right, let's keep moving here. Now, this drunken goldfish is, uh, these are excerpts from a book that I received many, many years ago. It's real research that people did, and you're like, why would people do that kind of research? Well, a lot of research is done in college, and it's there to teach students the proper technique of how you collect data and, and, and run experiments. So what you're studying isn't always as important. So here was one study. It said, well, let me go back up to it since I don't have the book in front of me. It talked about Siamese fighting fish. Now these are the fish that you can buy at Walmart for like two dollars and they're in a little individual uh, container. And if you put two of them together in a container, they fight each other. They don't want to be together. And so the research involved making the water that the fish was in about a 4% alcohol. And the researchers concluded that the fish became more aggressive and therefore humans, when drunk, also become more aggressive. Now that, that research is way out there. I'm not saying I believe it. I'm just saying this is what the research found. Here's another one. This one always brings a smile to my face. It says, uneducated worms appear to acquire knowledge by eating educated worms. Wow, that's really important stuff, isn't it? Now, I remember I was at a seminar one time in graduate school, and I was in the back row, and it was a topic that I didn't really care about. And the person started to talk about educated worms. And I'm sort of a, maybe a smart donkey, if you know what I'm talking about. So I raise my hand in the back of the room and I say, hey, how do you know if a worm is educated? And the professor said, well, it's actually quite simple. He said, you set up a maze and then you put food in the maze and you time how long it takes for the worm to find the food. Then you take the worm out and you put it back in and you'll realize that it gets through the maze faster each time. So it has become educated, evidently. So that brings me to the conclusion, well, all we have to do is sacrifice one or two of our maybe top performing students and then, you know, feed them to the other students and we'll increase the average for everyone in the school. Right? Now that's an absolute sick idea. And there is morals that must be applied to science. You can't just do something and call it science and think, that's okay, I can do that. It, it, there are still things that are criminal that you should not do. All right, this is a great one here. Rats are attracted to other rats more than to tennis balls. Wow. Now, I have no idea what this is about. However, I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to make something up and see if this makes any sense to you. A tennis ball is sort of fuzzy. A rat is sort of fuzzy. So that if you put a rat in a cage with another rat, they might spend more time together versus a rat to a tennis ball, even though they're similar. Now, I don't know if this has anything to do with adoption and trying to put uh, black adopted children with a black foster care family because they might be more similar. I don't know. But again, experiments are very simplistic oftentimes, and then the conclusions we draw from them may not always be valid. Let's try another one. All right, this was about disco music, and this research was done at the Aegean University in Ankara, Turkey in 1983. And what it basically said was disco music causes homosexuality in mice 
and deafness in pigs. Now, that is the most bizarre research I've ever seen. But you have to understand, in Ankara, Turkey in 1983, I believe it's a Muslim country, they're very anti-homosexuality, and they were going to try to correlate disco music with deviant behavior from what their perspective of what they would call deviant behavior. Um, again, you cannot allow your own personal prejudice to influence your research, and I believe that was clearly what was going on in that research. All right. So the bottom line here is when you do science, when you do research, your final conclusions must be supported by the data in order to be valid. All right, there's a little statement about the goldfish. You can kind of see there it said that they also lost their ability to swim upright and they went sideways after about six to eight minutes. So they would fall over as though they were drunk, evidently. That was what they were concluding from that one, I guess. All right, let's see what else we got. In an experiment, evidence must be reproducible. You don't just do an experiment one time, collect one data point. You do the experiment multiple times, have others repeat it, and then, and then collect data multiple times, and then average that data, and that way it's reproducible. It's genuine data, not just maybe a measurement error. We talked about a theory is a single big idea that stands up to scrutiny over time. It's based on lots and lots of experiments. Now, in science, the attitude that we have is that through inquiry, that's experimentation, if you do it honestly and in good faith, you can discover and understand the natural world around us. So we kind of went through the scientific method before, forming a hypothesis, grabbing your materials, running some procedure, an experiment, drawing your conclusions, and, and then make a valid statement about what it all means afterwards. Now, I mentioned earlier that science has to operate in the realms of morality. There was a scientist, a Nazi scientist named Joseph Mengele, that did some very, very disturbing experiments with twins in World War II. And he, uh, most, many of those children and his twins would have been uh, murdered, killed during the experiments, um, and horrible things were done. And he said he was doing it in the name of science. Nowadays, that would be completely unacceptable. Um, the atomic bomb, it, there's some morality to that. The atomic bomb was developed at uh, well, early work on that was done at University of Chicago in 1940s, early 1940s. Well, when the scientists figured out they could make a, an atomic bomb and drop this thing, they knew they were going to kill hundreds of thousands of people. But the calculus of it, the math said, if we have to invade Japan, because by then we had beat Germany, if we have to invade Japan, there will be maybe an estimated 5 million deaths on both sides. And majority of those would have been maybe Japanese lives. So they decided it was far more moral to end the war by dropping a bomb and killing 100,000 people. So we dropped a bomb, we killed 100,000 people. Then a week later we dropped a second bomb because they didn't surrender and they didn't believe we had a second bomb. Within hours of us dropping the second bomb, World War II was over. And so instead of five million deaths, there were probably only a quarter million deaths. So in that way, perhaps it was a moral decision. You could disagree, and that's fine. Um, I do believe we need arms control. Um, that's a, another discussion for a different time. Cloning of humans. Hey, what if we did this? What if the technology was so good that you could just do a mouth scraping, they could then clone you, and maybe what they're going to do is, you know, they'll build a big plant like the old Mitsubishi plant, the Rivian plant, and they'll just keep a, uh, a spare you, an extra body of you sitting there. Now, if you're driving on Veterans Parkway and getting a very bad accident and your arm gets severed off, they can just call over to the plant and say, hey, 
I need an arm for uh, Jeff Christofferson, a right arm, and they'll just reattach that. Now, that might sound really, really cool. Now, they could probably even remove the head and keep the body alive so it's maybe not so gross. Now, I think that's kind of disturbing, right? I know there's a shortage of organs and, and so on, and cloning might not be the answer, but there are uh, genetic stem cell gene therapy that scientists are developing, <coughs> excuse me, and lots of other really, really cool ideas that are uh, being studied. This has to be done thinking about the moral character of, of society. If you were to, uh, I'll give you an example. There was a very famous uh, clone animal called Dolly the Sheep. And Dolly was named after Dolly Parton because it was cloned from the mammary gland or breast tissue of a sheep. So scientists clearly have some sense of humor, I suppose. Now, they did not get a Dolly the Sheep on the first try. They would have had many iterations that failed, which means if you're cloning humans, you're going to have failed humans that are going to be aborted. And our society says that's a murder, that'd be murder, and we don't do that. Mentioned stem cell research as a possible way to cure cancer, cure MS, Parkinson's, lots of other things, Alzheimer's. This is an active area of research. If it's not allowed to be done in the U.S., it will be done elsewhere. So there's always a, that battle of where is this research going to be done because with that research comes lots of maybe financial reward if you find success. All right. Well, let's kind of go back here and just remind you about the scientific method. In the scientific method, you have some question, you make some observations, you form a hypothesis, then you run experiments based on your hypothesis with the new information, you draw new hypotheses, and you continue this loop until you feel you have a pretty good understanding of the situation. Once you do that, then all that data is combined to form a new theory. And then others can test that theory with more experiments. So that's the, in essence, how the scientific method works. In a scientific law, we have observations, we run experiments, and then we make some conclusion about what will happen, and that's called a law. Now, a scientific law does not explain why something happens. It just explains what will happen. There's a little bit of a difference there. All right, so there's some different theories. Uh, I'm not going to read those to you. We'll kind of talk about some of those maybe a little bit. So let's talk about the phlogiston theory. All right, here's a cool theory, and maybe you've done this before. Uh, I'm not suggesting do this at home right now, but if you have a candle and a cup, you can take a candle and light it, and then put a glass on top of the candle and time how long it takes for that candle to go out. Now take a glass that's twice as big and put it over a lit candle. And about how long will that take before the candle goes out? If you said twice as long, I think you're correct. And you can certainly test that hypothesis. The larger the cup you put on there, the longer the candle will burn. Now, an early theory of combustion was called the phlogiston theory. Now, what it said is this. Objects that burn release phlogiston in the air. When they no longer contain phlogiston, then they stop burning. Now, phlogiston is not a substance that you can smell. You can't hold it. You can't see it. But when an object burns, it releases phlogiston. And of course, if something doesn't burn, it either has been dephlogisticated or it contains no phlogiston in the beginning. So the object burns, releases phlogiston, and when the object no longer has phlogiston, the burning stops. Is that the theory of combustion that you know? I didn't think so. So why did the candle go out? Oh, you said it ran out of oxygen. Now, I'm going to ask you, can you see oxygen? No. 
how do you know it's there? See, that's a theory, isn't it? The combustion theory of burning. Now, it turns out that Antoine Lavoisier came up with the modern theory or the combustion theory of burning. He said when an object burns, it uses up oxygen in the surrounding space. And when there's no longer any oxygen, the object goes out. Now, he, he figured this out by doing careful observation. He took a, a um, like an iron gun, and then he weighed it, and then he heated it up a lot and then it ended up oxidizing, getting rust on it, and it weighed more after it was burned than less. And that was sort of an aha moment that things actually get heavier when we burn them, not lighter. Now I have a fire pit, I burn my wood, and it's a lot of weight to carry that wood up, and the next day when I'm done, I have very light ash. So does that contradict what I said? No, not at all. If I were to take, when you burn wood, it produces both carbon dioxide gas and water vapor. If you were to capture and catch all that and weigh the weight of the ash, the carbon dioxide gas, and the water, it would be identical to the weight of the wood and air when you begin. That's called the law of conservation of mass. Matter is neither created nor destroyed. It simply can change forms. We would watch this little video, but it's uh, not that interesting, so I'm not going to click it. I'm just going to keep moving on. And so here is the phlogiston theory one more time. Flammable materials contain phlogiston. Those that don't burn contain no phlogiston. When a substance is burning, it releases phlogiston into the air. Burning stops only when the object is out of phlogiston or the surrounding air contains too much phlogiston and then it will go out. Okay, So theories change. That was the accepted theory of burning for hundreds of years. People wouldn't have thought that was silly. If, In fact, if you would have talked about the oxygen theory of burning in 1550, I'm sure people would have thought you were crazy because you couldn't show them oxygen. It was not an element that was known they were still dealing with the four elements fire, air, earth, and water and if you want to throw in ether that would be fine. So how could we test this? Well we could take a strip of magnesium metal, it burns quite readily and we'll put it in this little vesicle here, it's called a crucible and we could record the mass of that before we start. Then we could light that magnesium and it will burn very, very bright. It's what they used to use in old flash bulbs. And when you're done burning it, what you'll be left with is a pile of ash, a white powder. Now, if you were to then put these on a balance, there's a strip of magnesium, there's the white powder. The white powder weighs more. So indeed, it gained mass. It did not lose mass in this process. So that would be evidence, experimental evidence, to support the combustion theory of matter. And it would basically say the phlogiston theory of matter is not correct. All right, we'll kind of look at that again. I guess we're just seeing it animate, getting heavier after we're done. That's fine. So the mass increased. And the magnesium did not lose phlogiston. But instead, it gained oxygen. All right, great. Here's another way we could do that. Uh, you know, some of you were questioning, well, if you burn that, wouldn't it release gas? It absolutely would. I was trying to be sim simple there. Here it is a little bit more complicated. You've got the uh, uh, closed system. You've got an Erlenmeyer flask here with magnesium metal. It's been pumped full of oxygen, and you've got a nichrome wire to a lead. You then can hit a button, a piezoelectric starter, and it will cause the magnesium to burn inside that container, and no gas will leave. When you're all done, you have the white powder. So when you look at the weights there, you realize that indeed the mass is conserved. Now wait a minute, we said it was going to get heavier, didn't we? Why is it conserved? Oh, because of the law of conservation of 
matter or the law of conservation of mass. Because this is a closed system, nothing's coming in, nothing's coming out, it is going to weigh the same before and after. Here's the chemical equation for that. I've written a balanced chemical equation. Two magnesium atoms plus one molecule of oxygen will produce two magnesium oxide formula units. And so I have two mg's here, two mg's here. This two coefficient in the front, you kind of use like the distributive property in math, it means there's also two oxygens on the, this is called the product side, and there are two oxygens on the reactant side. So indeed it is balanced. We'll worry about balancing equations in another unit, so don't worry about that at this point. All right, let's talk a little bit about a Bunsen burner. Uh, a Bunsen burner is uh, a very clean burning heat source used in a lab. Most of the time we don't use Bunsen burners anymore because some of the chemicals we use are volatile, they evaporate very quickly into the air, and can be highly flammable. And so using an open flame in a chemistry lab could cause fire. So usually we use a hot plate instead. Robert Bunsen invented these uh, probably about 150 years ago. He was a friend and knew uh, uh, Dmitry Mendeleev, the person who came up with the first periodic table, even, even though they were from different countries, they knew one another. Um, he needed this, what we'll learn later, to make flame emission tests. He needed a very clean burning flame. And when we're in class, I'll show you how to light them and, and, and we can play a little bit with a Bunsen burner. When you adjust a Bunsen burner, you want to make sure that you have a small inner blue flame. That's the hottest part. You can spin this silver metal barrel to get less oxygen or more oxygen into the fuel. If you have less oxygen, you will get a very orange flame and there will be no blue in it at all. It will not be that hot. If you go very, very little oxygen, it will to make soot and you'll get a black powder from an incomplete combustion. All right, I'm not going to ask you a lot of questions on a, a Bunsen burner, but we will talk a little bit about glassware. So here's a, a photograph of a Bunsen burner. Um, when you light a Bunsen burner, you always light the match first and then hold it up near the stem, and then you turn on the gas afterwards. That's the air adjustment, spinning that whole column. And then you can adjust the gas that comes in through this little thing on the bottom called a spud. It's just a little valve that opens up to let more gas in or not. Uh, all right, I'm not going to worry about the transparency anymore, that slide. Um, I'm not worried about the temperature of the flame. There are different types of burners. There are Bunsen burners and there are Meeker burners. Meeker burners, I'll show you when we meet in class, are much larger and much hotter. They will melt metal. They're that hot. All right. Uh, I gave you a picture. I think it was on Goldenrod, if I recall. Maybe it was blue, but I think it was Goldenrod. And it has pictures of laboratory equipment. If we were in class, that would have been something I would have had you memorize, and then we would have taken a quiz over it. But because I don't anticipate us doing a lot of labs, I'm not going to hold you accountable for knowing the names of all of those. Um, but it's there for reference. If you decide to go in and do more science later in your academic career, you'll probably want to be familiar with some of those pieces of glassware. All right. Uh, that's as far as I wanted to get on this little video section. So have a great day. And again, thank you for watching my video. Bye-bye.